Hi, y'all. In this video, I'll be responding to a Canadian who has an opinion on American gun laws. Adoso Buckley did a video titled The Arguments of Pro-Gun People. In a second, I'm going to have you take it away, sir. Just please try not to be too much of an a-hole, alright? If you're sick of me talking about guns, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I'm sick of talking about guns, too. So sick of talking about it, are you, that you have to go look at the internal politics of a foreign country in order to find the subject being talked about in order to join in on the conversation. How peculiar. I'm sick of hearing about guns and gun-related violence. I'm not going to mention the most recent incident because... It... For those who are keeping track, that's a rhetorical trick known as apophysis. It's where you mention something by denying that you'll talk about it. If you were, say, arguing with a Catholic priest, you, you could uh, say something along the lines of, in order to poison them, you could say something along the lines of, I'm not even, I'm not even going to mention the fact that my uh, interlocutor here represents an organization that has protected child rapists. All right, keep going, sir. Doesn't matter. I'm going to try and make this dose as generic as possible, so I can just post this link every time there's another shooting. And there's going to be plenty of opportunities for that, because Americans are completely unwilling to do anything other than shrug their shoulders and say, well, nothing we can do about it. That is not true. You apparently don't distinguish between uh, not wanting to do what you want to do on the proviso that your particular proposed course of action doesn't seem to be effective. Uh, you, you take that to mean something like they, want, they don't want to do anything about it. There are things that could be done that don't include your particular course of action that people are uh, perfectly willing to do. But uh, putting that off to the side. Except in every other country they have done something about it, clearly. Because the United States is the only developed nation where this happens with this amount of frequency. That's true. In fact, I'll go one step further. It's the only country where it happens with that amount of frequency. But that's true of every country. Uh, no two countries are identical, and they don't have the same frequency of events happening. Uh, so, you say all of nothing. It's, it's curious that uh, you like to use um, words that you don't define, like, we need to do something, the, the ever-elusive something that must be done, that uh, you decline to define and a uh, particular amount of free, you know, all these things that you want to talk about, you don't define them so the way they are so generic as to be useless. But, I mean, if, it, if it's cathartic for you, by all means, carry on. And every time, pro-gun people have the exact same arguments, the exact same metaphors. And that's because the uh, anti-gun folks, like yourself, don't come up with anything original. You have the same arguments in every case. It should not be surprising that when you don't come up with anything new, the responses to what you say will likewise not be particularly new. Similes, analogies. In fact, Tucker Carlson, Fox News correspondent, who's also worked for MSNBC, CNN, basically all the 24-hour channels have put up with him for some length of time or another, trotted this old gem out. When there's a drunk driving accident, you don't ban cars. You try to prevent drunk people from driving them. And yet, when it Actually, uh, that's one step that's been taken. There were other steps that have been taken. For example, uh, I know Vernaculus mentioned this in his video in response to you. Uh, but we, we redesigned the way the cars uh, deform when they crash. It used to be that you wanted hard cars where the squishy bodies inside would deform. And then we reversed that, so now it's soft cars. Uh, so that way it's the cars that deform instead of the squishy humans inside. Uh, airbags, um, seatbelts, obviously. Uh, the way those are constructed, the way the roadways are constructed and designed now, retention devices, all kinds of things have been put, have been done uh, on the understanding that nothing that you do on the legislation end of the house, the legislation side of the house, actually prevents people from driving drunk. You've got to do other things to mitigate these circumstances when they do happen, among other things, other other types of accidents. So instead of the the apparent um, the apotropaic propositions that you have on offer. The people who are actually interested in saving lives decided to look at it as an engineering problem and to put in remedies on the engineering side of the house that would take care of these, these facts about human nature that just can't be gotten away from. This is the distinction between looking at a problem and finding solutions versus coming up with a mantra, which is what you and your retarded friends like to do. We need another gun law! We need... And when, when you have a century of that always being the response from your side of the argument, and it never once giving you what you want, and yet every time that's all you've got, it should not be surprising that, you know, eventually people are going to catch wise to that shit and say, you know, maybe, just possibly, your proposed solution 
is not an effective one. Let's look at other things. Let's look at it like an engineering problem and actually devise uh, solutions to these types of problems in exactly the same way they've done with the, uh, the drunk driving thing. Though I don't know if Tucker Carson's smart enough to figure that kind of stuff out. I don't know who the guy is. Sorry, I don't watch the uh, same nonsense you do. I'm actually interested in not uh, failing to learn something. I like to learn things, and I'm, I'm a slight believer in intellectual osmosis, so I don't pay a lot of attention to the news on, on the fear that uh, it'll suck out my intelligence. Anyone even brings up the idea of gun regulation and control, not banning guns, we're not talking about that yet. And yet, there's always that pregnant pause when talking to your side of the argument, and indeed the places you like to point to as the exemplars of your system are places where there are either uh, complete gun bans or they might as well be complete gun bans. And then, you know, gun owners say, gee, maybe after a century of this trajectory, and all of the, the things they want to point to leading to the same conclusion, perhaps what these people are doing is just a dishonest backdoor attempt to ban firearms. Just maybe. People still scream, my rights, my rights. Let's use the famous drunk driving analogy. You're right. You. Yeah, my rights. My, my rights don't rise or fall because of your fears. You know, if you want to amend the Constitution, there's Article 5. You could make use of that and do it that way. Of course, uh, we all know that you, well, not you because you're Canadian. Well, yeah, you because you're Canadian, you're completely irrelevant. But your side of the argument in the United States is unable to do that. And indeed, they're unwilling to even try because it's hard work and they don't want to do hard work. They want the easy solution or the easy supposed solution. Yeah. My rights do not rise and fall because of your pusillanimity. My rights remain unmolested because of your cowardice or your emotional state. This is true on all manner of things. The, the fact, the Bill of Rights that we have in the United States that we wrote into our Constitution, those aren't there necessarily because they're the most important rights. I mean, they're not. They're there because those are the ones that tyrants invariably come after. When you, when you become a tyrant or a despot of some type and you want to go about oppressing uh, certain people, uh, don't give them trials. Don't let them arm themselves. Don't let them print uh, heretical publications. Don't let them argue the opposing point of view. Don't let them plead their case to a jury of their peers. Don't let them say no to the state coming to their house and looking for things. Don't give them the option not to become the instruments of their own demise in, in a mock trial. That's why those things are there. Don't ban cars. But think about how much it takes to legally drive a car. Uh, not much, really. Um, I, I, I realize you're going to put up a long list here. When I was coming of age, uh, you, could, you could start driving in my state at the age of 14. Uh, the way that the, 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 uh, the graduation and driving privileges operates, and here it's important to know that this is a privilege, not a right. They're distinct. Uh, privileges are creatures of the legislature, which they can amend at will. Rights are something that are taken out of the hands of legislatures. That is beyond their power to uh, do with, as they should like to do. That's, again, why we wrote it there. It's to prevent uh, people who we don't trust to have power to wisely use it. Say so these things just aren't appropriate for you to interfere with at all. Uh, thanks for your opinion. If you want to do anything with these, you can be like all the rest of the citizens and uh, agitate for the constitutions being amended. But anyway, it, it works a little bit like this. Once you reach the age of majority, all, well, not all these things, but uh, this, um, all this schooling and everything, that goes away. The way it works is if you are under the age of majority, as a matter of legislative grace, we will, we will set out a pathway for you to prove yourself worthy of having a driving license. And if you spend a lot of money and a lot of time in these schools and jump through all these hoops uh, successfully, we will grant you the right to drive when you are underage. If you don't want to go through all that, wait until you're 18, go in, take your test, pay your money, walk out with your driver's license like everybody else. That's, that's the long and the short of it. So you, you go in, you know, however long it will take you to get it, once you reach the age of majority, is, well, I guess you, should, you get your insurance card or whatever. And then you go to the DMV and you walk up, you wait in line, say, I need to take the test. They'll, you know, there's the testing room. You go over there, you take the test. And then however long it takes you to do all the paperwork and get back in line and walk up there and have your cheesy picture taken, that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of getting a firearm. Now, in my state, if you want uh, to get a firearm, there's a waiting period. Now, as, uh, as a way of getting around that, you can get a concealed weapons permit for the ordinary citizens, which takes you uh, up to, I, I think they have a 30-day waiting period on that. 
And then because it's a shall issue state, it's either 30 or 90. But in no event is the sheriff prohibited from giving you, any, the, I'm sorry, in no event is the sheriff permitted not to give you the uh, the concealed weapons permit if after a certain period of time has passed, he has, ref he has declined to do the investigation or the investigation hasn't been returned. And this is simply because uh, the, the people who write the laws, uh, when they were thinking about this at the founding, were a little bit smarter than you are, and they realized that one way that assholes in government like to uh, use their power is by just sitting on things. And so we took care of that by writing a law uh, in the Constitution, even here, that says, um, if you are one of those assholes in government, the issue will, uh, the, the license will automatically issue, so you better do your job anyway, because if you don't do it, the person gets the license anyway. It's beyond your power. You must issue it unless the person is debarred by mental incompetence or conviction for a felony at the time, and now there's domestic violence uh, convictions, or a dishonorably discharge from the military. You have to get a license. In order to do so, you need to prove to someone not just that you're old enough to drive, but that you're capable. Only if you're underage. Other, capable. You take a test. It's like 20 or 25 questions that you answer. Uh, maybe a driving test, depending on where you live. And then you get the license if you're of age. You don't have to do all, all the rest of the stuff. So you get the license, you get your insurance, you take the little test, pay your $30 or whatever it is in your state, and ta-da, you've got your cheesy license. Depending on where you live? This can be a pretty long process. If you're underage. You get your learner's permit. Nope. Then you have to drive with someone in the passenger seat. Then you have a number of restrictions put on as to when you can drive and what roads you're allowed on. That's, again, this is only for minors. This isn't for people who have reached the age of majority. So you're comparing what we do with children to what is uh, true of adults. This is just another example of people on your side of the argument <laughs> grasping at straws that are already overreaching to grasp for other straws. I mean, this is an extension of straw grasping that, that is just like amazing. You don't know what you're talking about. Finally, you have to then demonstrate to the government that you can drive by passing a test. This, By the way, none of this is true for people who want to buy a car, just so you know. You, you can buy a car without a license or insurance or anything else. So if you want to get like a, a, a license for people to shoot their guns, you'd have the ghost of a point. But you want a license on the selling and the purchasing of it, not not the getting a not the carrying and using of it. Process takes months, in some areas years, before you're allowed to operate a motor vehicle by yourself. And when you reach the age of majority, During it takes time, you certainly can't maybe hours. A car. I mean, you could, but you can't drive it on your own. I don't know about there, but in Canada, you need proof of a full license and you need insurance before you can drive the car off the lot. Yes, and in the United States, we have these things called private transactions, which people can sell to themselves without all this onerous paperwork. Although, I, I will say, uh, just as, as an American, and I want to be like a good, ordinary, average American here and point out, I don't give a fuck what you do in Canada. Nothing that we model our system on is, it has it been, hey, look at what Canada does. Let's follow suit. Let's do what Canada did. Thank you. No. Uh, you can shove that right up your a-hole. Dealership could be in huge shit. All of these a dealership, that is a condition that is put on the, the business license, a restriction that's put on the, the commerce, people who want to engage in business transactions as a company. It's part of the incorporation rules. Uh, it says nothing whatever about what happens between private citizens. These are regulations in some sort of attempt to create safer drivers, because the old system was you went to the DMV, paid your money, drove around the block, and you were licensed to drive a car. And it shows in that per capita, there were far more automotive-related deaths years ago than there are today in the United States. Which isn't because of the driving licenses, it's because of all the other things I mentioned. This is part of my bailiwick. I, 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 you know, the AASHTO regulations are there, which deal with how roadways are constructed. There's NHTSA, these things that I know you know nothing about because you don't, you don't do any learning. You're not a person who's interested in knowing things before he speaks his mind. You're just a person who's interested in speaking his mind, and then maybe later you might possibly look into something, but if not, then oh well, it doesn't really matter, because the facts and reason aren't what matter to you. Now, I get that you do a comedy channel, so I shouldn't be taking you seriously, but unfortunately a lot of people will take you seriously, and they'll think that you're speaking sensibly, and they'll think that because you're popular, it somehow follows that uh, you're that you're popular because you're smart, or you know what you're talking about when this isn't true. States. Yes, people still die but the number is going down. That's true of gun murders, too. I mean, you know, potato, potato. 
And funny enough, no one screams, my freedoms are being taken away. And that's because there's a distinction between a right and a privilege. Privileges are things that you earn. Privileges are things that can be taken away on a lark. Rights are things that are beyond the government's power to take away. Please learn the distinction. I realize you're from Canada, and so it's hard for you to realize that, but there are actually distinctions between privileges and rights. I mean, you guys only got around to really, really doing something constitutionally in you know, 1982 is when you really started, you know, you had the Constitution Act and you really started thinking about these things. So I know it's, it's not something that is just built into the spirit of being Canadian, but that's not true of the United States. Again, at no point do we look at Canada and say, we need to do what Canada is doing. In indeed, it seems to be the other way around, that the other countries are coming around to the American way uh, of looking at things and, and uh, you know, separating out the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, and having something like checks and balances built into the system, these notions of rights. A very recent thing in Canada. Uh, I look forward to you guys really trying to wrestle with what a right is as opposed to a privilege. Best of luck. If you need help, call us down here. We'll be happy to give you some advice. We have lots of experience. They introduced some new legislation regarding driving. Why? Well, because the right to drive isn't in the Constitution. The right to own guns is. Yes. Except most people who quote that have no fucking idea what they're... Yeah, you being a chief example in a moment, you're going to show that uh, you know nothing about the law or history. It's curious that whenever I talk to people who imagine that they know what they're talking about, they want to whine about how the average American doesn't know this or that, uh, they are always less well-educated than I am and or less intelligent than I am. Usually both, but at least one. It, it just never seems to be false. Um, you, you know, you want to talk about people from the South. I'm from the South. I'm a mathematician, bitch. You will never be as well-educated as I am. Uh, I used to work in law enforcement. I know the law quite well. You will never rival me on that. There's no subject about which I care to speak in public that you will ever compete with me in, in knowledge. You will never be my equal on these subjects. And yet you want to walk around and act as though you are the one who knows what you're talking about. And it's all the, it's the hoi polloi who don't understand. Sir, you are the unwashed masses. You are the hoi polloi. Talking about. I mean, the average Canadian doesn't know that the Queen can prorogue or dissolve your parliament on a lark. That the reserve powers are a thing. Uh, you know, they don't know about the King Bing affair of 1925, the King Bing thing, where the Governor General dismissed the government of the day. Uh, the Australian Constitutional Crisis of 1975. Uh, putting it off, I realize you're not Australian, but I mean, these things happen. These are, these are powers that are inherent to the Crown, which we don't have to contend with because, unlike what you're going to say later in the video, we Americans are actually pretty good at doing new things, like establishing a really stable republic with lots of freedoms, uh, you know, and getting rid of, of the monarchy, throwing off a tyrant, and being successful in its wake. You know, not a very common thing in the past. Having a written constitution that grants to people, I'm sorry, that doesn't grant to people, uh, that, that respects the rights that people have reserved to themselves, something your country is still gra grappling with. Again, if you need help, call us. We'll be happy to give you some advice. We do lots of new things, and it seems to be that the, uh, the rest of the world is following suit with us in a lot of different ways. Um, well, I'll talk about this more when you get there. Ask someone to quote the Second Amendment, word for word. A, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What now, bitch? I'll probably... Uh, ask, ask a Canadian to, to quote... Look, ask an American to quote the First Amendment, or the, or the Third, or the Fourth, or the Fifth, or the Sixth. There are reasons that we give people lawyers when they go into court. It's because we don't expect a well-educated, a generally well-educated citizen to be constitutional scholars who are able to recite, uh, <laughs> at any moment, large portions of the Constitution. They only need to understand the general lay of the land. For the rest of it, you have lawyers who argue about this, and lawyers, unlike you, are trained in the law and interpreting legal texts, which is what the Constitution is. Ask, ask an American to, to quote to you Article 1, or Article 2, or Article 3. Well, I guess if they can't do that, it calls into question whether or not we have a Congress that's, uh, that has two, par two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, I guess that means it calls into question whether or not we have a president, you know, that's Article 2, or whether or not we have uh, federal courts, that's Article 3. No, the fact that people can't give you ipsissima in, in, uh, uh, you, um, on, on a lark, I'm sorry, on a, um, 
shit. At a moment's notice, a recitation of, of provisions of the Constitution says nothing whatever. They probably can't quote you the license statute either, but that doesn't mean they're, they're, there's any doubt about the, the, uh, their, their right to drive, their privilege to drive. Say something like, we the people have the right to keep and bear arms. Yes. Which is not what it says. What it says... Not in Hike Werba. ...is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state... The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Very good. A well-regulated militia. See, you're kind of the retarded person, the hoi polloi in this conversation, who thinks you're saying something. Well-regulated, to a layman, will mean something like the word well, the definition of that, plus the word regulated, and, uh, and then you put those two together and it'll be something that has lots of rules and government oversight. That's not what well-regulated well means. It is a term of art used in the 18th and 19th centuries, and all it means is functioning. So to translate that into uh, you know, not legal ease, it means a functioning militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. This part is constantly ignored. Nope. We'll even ignore it's not ignored. You're just too ignorant to know what it means, and you think that presents a problem for my side of the argument, when all it does is show that what you should do before you open your unlettered trap is go get something that passes for an education. Or the idea that it was meant to be for members of a recognized militia only. That's not true. Uh, there are two classes of militia in the United States, and this has always been true. You have the organized militia, which is what you have in mind, but you also have the unorganized militia. This is, uh, you know, the Minutemen were a great example of this. Uh, they formed themselves, selected their own officers, when, when uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony wanted them to do something, they would have a little uh, convocation to get together and recommend to the Minutemen that they go do something, and the Minutemen would receive the, the recommendation and look at it and either say yes or no. It was completely independent of the government. They did, whatever, they, did what they wanted to. They were separate from the government-controlled uh, militia. Uh, you look at the Militia Act of 1792, the first Militia Act of 1792, and then the second Militia Act of 1792. The militia was all able-bodied citizens, males, between uh, under the age of 45. If you go look at uh, 10 U.S.C. 311 today, it's all, it's all uh, men under the age of 45 who are citizens and, by the way, who are, uh, who are here, who aver that they are going to become citizens. That's the organized militia. And then it says, except for is provided in uh, Section 13 of Title 32. So you go look at, what's 32 U.S.C. 313 say? Oh, it's, it's an expansion of the organized militia. It, it is all persons, all males, who have previously served in the, organized, in the military, uh, who have not reached the age of 64 are part of the organized militia. And then you go back to 10 U.S.C. 311 and you read the second part and it says, and women who are in the National Guard. So that's the organized militia. And then you have the, the unorganized militia. This is not complicated. All you have to do is know a little bit about the law. Just a little bit. Which is more than you know. Let's pretend this really means Johnny Fuckface should be allowed to own a gun. It does. Well... I'm sorry, I mean, I'll pretend with you. Regu oh, by the way, the, se the Second Militia Act dragooned all, as I mentioned, all the able-bodied men. It conscripted them into the militia. And this was on fears, actually because of a loss uh, against some Indians in the Western Front. Uh, look, you don't know what you're talking about, dumbass. It is every swinging dick who's not otherwise disabled because of long-standing exemptions to certain things in the common law, like uh, convictions for... Um, infamous and notorious crimes, which used to get you just killed. So it was kind of a, <laughs> didn't really matter if they took away your gun, you know, because you were going to be killed for, for the conviction. And, and things of that nature, the, the insane. Plated. It's not. Oh, there are background checks in some states, and in, you have to wait three days. In all states, there are background checks. In all states, there are background checks. Is to get your assault rifle, unless, of course, you just go to a gun show, which, huh, look... One's happening in the back of this store right now. And so everything you were saying about the cars, I guess if I just pick up like a Auto Traders magazine, because that's how we do it with cars, it should be that way with guns. And I would just point out that there are private sales of firearms, like there are private sales of uh, motor vehicles. You seem to be fine with the one, I'm fine with the other. You don't need to do half of the shit you need to do to get a driver's license. In oh, no, no, no. 
these things you talk about having to do with the driver's licenses are these are courtesies we extend to people who are underage, which we don't extend to people who aren't old enough to buy firearms for then. Uh, you know, you've got to have a parent with you. All these other things that need to be there. You can't actually uh, go out and buy your, your own gun. Uh, sorry. Even if you can prove that you're mentally competent and, you know, you know not to, like, shoot your brother in the face or whatever it is. Not to, you know, not to do him shotgun style. Bend him over and pump a hot load in his ass or whatever. I don't know what we're talking about anymore. Even if, uh, even if you can prove that you know all those things, you still need more, and it's not like getting a driver's license. You don't get a concealed weapons permit when you're underage, no matter what you can show. In order to own a gun. And I will just point out, uh, where I grew up, which is the South, and I know everyone thinks people from the South are stupid. Uh, generally, these people are less well-educated than I am, but anyway. Uh, you, I guess you would have, like, lost your shit watching a 10 or 11-year-old me walk into the convenience store with a, you know, Haskell 45 strapped on my hip to buy a sun drop and some nabs or whatever. Fuck you, dude. Uh, not a lot of problems with people going around accidentally blowing each other's heads off where I grew up. Very well-behaved society, I have to say. In many places... Oh, and I guess it would also uh, uh, bother you a little bit that if we could operate farm equipment on the open roads without licenses at the time so I could get on my dad's tractor and drive to the store with my own pistol strapped on, you know, got my snake boots on or whatever, walk into the gas station with my Haskell 45 that I carried, you know, against snakes, for deal with snakes or whatever. <laughs> oh my god, your head would fucking explode if you came where I, if you were like transported to where I grew up. And, and how things work there. And we didn't have any of these problems that you're worried about. Driving on the interstate, got a tractor, whatever it is. This is in the States. You don't need a license. There's no such thing as gun insurance. You don't need to prove to anyone that you're capable of handling a gun in a safe manner. All legally owned cars... I, I agree. Uh, because, you know, the position that you're arguing for is really, we need to make sure that our murderers... Uh, <laughs> are really good shots. They're really competent with firearms. None of this... We... Look, one shot, one kill, whoa. No, none of this spray and pray shit, motherfuckers. When you pull that trigger, you need to make sure you get somebody, Mr. Murderer, man. I mean, what are you arguing for? Registered with a government agency. Is every legally owned firearm registered? I'm gonna tell you right now, the answer is no. But again... And it never will be so long as I... As, so long as I'm alive. Forcing people to do that? All sorts of excuses not to. The biggest of which, my freedom! Forcing. Yes. Uh, you've got a hundred some odd million folks here who really love their rights for some peculiar queer reason. And it's not just that we stand around going, my rights! Because you're talking about force. You will not force a hundred million well-armed people to do something without having lots and lots and lots of corpses to step over. Uh, you know, rivers of blood will flow in America's streets if you ever try to visit that upon us. So, um, you, Mr. Brave Man, imagine that uh, people, many people have come around your way of thinking and you're going to go f uh, foist this upon a hundred million armed people who are saying, over my dead body. That is what keeps government power in check. Now, it, I know it's, uh, you, you Americans, you'll stand no chance against your government with your deer rifle. If it's you and Bob, you get out there with your beer can and walk up there and plant a flag and challenge the American military, you'll lose. Well, of course, those guys would. But it doesn't need to be at the federal level that it's effective, even though uh, uh, there are two people, two types of people, who uh, seem to believe otherwise. Tyrants and military planners. Uh, military planning is another subject on which I know you are pig and shit ignorant. But in any event, take something like the Battle of Athens. You want to talk about tyranny and whatnot. Tyranny doesn't have to be large in order for it to count. And indeed, it's much better if it's dealt with before it gets large. Hitlers don't arise at the full height of their power by snapping their goddamn fingers. It takes years for them to rise to it. They start somewhere. Imagine what wouldn't, what our history would not have been had... Hitler's mom had an abortion. But we would uh, then have to ask counterfactual questions, which is what this inquiry is. What would be, it be like if the world were exactly different from ha than how it actually has uh, come about? But anyway, the Battle of Athens. Uh, after a decade of begging the federal government and the state government to come in and deal with a corrupt local government, the federal and state government going, eh, not our problem. Fuck you. Actually, they did investigations, and then after the investigations, they decided, eh, we're not going to do anything. Fuck you. 
uh, some veterans returning from fighting the Hitler and, the, and those folks decided, we've had enough of this shit. Um, the sheriff in that town got chair of deputies from all the surrounding communities, a couple hundred of them, to come in and literally steal the election. To a, they, they shot a black guy who for voting, and then they stole all the ballots and absconded with the ballots to prevent them from being counted, so that way the current sheriff, the corrupt asshole in his government, would be ousted. So they were going to take those ballots to a, you know, the city jail or wherever it was, county jail, count them in secret, and then announce the results, which I, I'm sure would have showed that uh, the sheriff, <laughs> by an overwhelming majority, had been reelected. Well, the veterans uh, and others decided no. So with a combination of their own privately owned firearms, uh, they went down to, I'm sorry, with their own privately firearms, they went down to the National Guard Armory, raided it, and then set siege to the town. Thousands of them going after the government. Surrounded it, and after several hours of a gun battle, the veterans got tired of this, so they used explosives to remove the front of the building. <laughs> And then they stormed the beaches of Athens. Okay, they walked into the jail and they liberated the, uh, these, these, these ballots which were being held hostage. And then they ran the tyrant out of town. Now, some people, uh, some people have stupidly said that doesn't count because the National Guard was caught up. The National Guard was caught up by the governor and then ordered to leave the situation alone, not to go in there, uh, I guess, because it was being handled by the people who live there in their own sovereign right to defend their own rights against a tyrannical government. Now, when you have that kind of thing happening, that is stopping a tyrant right at the smallest level before they get too powerful and are able to commit a genocide. But for morons like you, motherfuckers like you, useless pieces of shit like you, you imagine that unless you stop Hitler at his strongest, it doesn't count to stop a Hitler. It counts to stop a Hitler no matter when you stop it. Uh, it's better to do it earlier than later, but it counts all the same. Now, that's, that's an example from the past. That's 1946 46 or 47 when this happened. Uh, let's look at current events. Well, they're not current now because they're in the past, but they recently happened. I'm talking last year and the year before. In my little hamlet, my little state here of uh, Washington, socially liberal, um, but when it comes to rights, it's, it's a bit libertarian. Like, you know, see some queens walking out in drag with a pink pistol on their hip walking into a store to buy shit. I love Washington State. Anyway... There was a city, a little town, decided that it was going to go tyrannical and prohibit carrying of firearms, concealed or, or open, in, in public places. Just, nope, not going to have this shit in, on, in public places. This is, uh, this is an illegal action. Uh, this is a, a power that is expressly denied to, uh, to local governments in Washington state. It's, it's legally, I mean, it's not like one of those, well, you interpret it one way, it says, uh, no locals, account. I can't cite the language to you, but it says that the local governments are prohibited from enacting gun laws, that uh, they just can't do it. It's just, it's just not within the remit. So the government does this. Citizens of that town, one of them decides to go to the town and ask during a council session, uh, uh, whereupon one of the council members found out that the guy was armed. He's a, he's a veteran. He you know, served our military honorably, came back uh, wounded, and he had a concealed weapon in there, and the, the guy wanted to have the guy escorted out of there. And, the, and Well, this isn't, this isn't part of the official record, so I won't tell you anything about the behind-the-story story. But anyway, I'll just, I'll just point out, the police weren't going to remove the, the citizen. But anyway, the guy wanted the, the police to remove him. Uh, the the long and the short of that is is that the city city councilman wound up running away from the city council because he was afraid that someone had a gun in there. Good. Government officials should be afraid about uh, acting unlawfully when they're restricting the rights of their citizens. They should be afraid of that. They should be worried that doing that might result in a bullet in their head. That that should be something they think about before they go before they go doing something uh, that is a, is an absolute violation of their delineated powers and indeed is a contradiction of something that the citizens citizens have enacted that expressly and unequivocally restricts from them the power to do it. They should think about that. A little, you know, I'm like Thomas Jefferson here. A little rebellion every now and again is kind of a good thing. But anyway, so uh, the next meeting that they had, uh, the veteran had friends who were slinging their rifles. They weren't carrying concealed anymore. They marched on them carrying their firearms, and they walked in. And, and uh, you know, some of them were children of Holocaust survivors. And it seemed to be that the citizens, who after all are the ones who are sovereign here, had decided that, you know, maybe, just possibly, this is our fucking city, city council, not yours. We're going to try. Uh, we're going to sue you first. It's going to cost uh, you a lot of money and turn us for our taxes. But if that doesn't, uh, if that doesn't work, look around you. Do not cross us on this. Like the one guy said, I will not go quietly into the night. Uh, if it comes to it, you guys will be dead, not us. 
That is direct action from citizens, from the unorganized militia rising up against tyrannical action of the government. This is working precisely as intended, exactly what was in the minds of the framers. Go look at Connecticut. When the Connecticut government decided they were going to have a registra registration or force confiscation, the state police saying, we're going to go collect these guns, we're going to enforce these laws. And, you know, two-thirds of the gun owners that there said, fuck you. We're not going to do what you tell us to. And indeed, there are many citizen uh, organizations that said, look, um, you guys want the guns? You want to come door to door and grab these guns? Uh, start. We'll meet you wherever you show up and we'll see who wins. Bring it. We're calling your bluff. Start the confiscation. Start them right now, State Patrol. We're ready. Come get our guns. And the state wisely uh, showed its true hand and it backed down. Its inner coward came out and it retreated exactly like it should have. What it should have done is not enact that law in the first place. But threatening to tyrannize citizens by going door to door to collect their rifles because they don't want a registration? Yeah, this is exactly how the system is supposed to work. When the, when the government oversteps its bounds, the citizens have an unquestionable right to rise up against, us. There, against it. There is a distinction between a rebellion and a revolution. Uh, it is... It is in the lifeblood of this country. This country started that way by throwing off the queen that you guys in 1982 elected to keep. You're welcome to it. We don't want your system. All we ask is that you leave us the fuck alone, but you can't do it. So not interested in this conversation, are you, that you can't keep your nose out of our internal business. Tucker Carlson says places like Australia, Canada, and parts of Europe have no freedom because we have strict regulations or outright... Well, I don't know about Tucker Carlson, but you guys have privileges. Uh, you have rights that emanate from the legislature at its grace. Legisl parliamentary supremacy, something we don't have here. Citizens actually have rights, and unlike the citizens in these countries, we are able to, on our own, without government permission, or indeed over government objection, take direct action to secure to ourselves and preserve our own liberties and our own rights. And this country has shown time and time and time again when it comes to the usurpation of individual liberties, we'll tolerate it only for so long before we rise up and have armed conflict. That is always what is at the end of the road for governmental action, uh, for organization of society. It's how much are you willing to sacrifice in lives in order to prevail. This country has shown there is not any cost for liberty that we're, we're unprepared to pay. We will sacrifice anything and everything to insist upon these rights, but people like you, sheep of the world, don't understand what America is about. Which makes perfect sense. You don't live here. It's foreign to you. Leave it alone, but you can't. But you know, that's fine, you're free to have an opinion, I don't mind. But the moment that you and your allies, or you, the people who are on your side of the argument, I don't, want to mention, I don't want to imply anything about collusion, actually start this tyranny, you better watch out. You have more than 100 million people here who are heavily armed and aren't going to just bend over. You know, they're not going to bohica, they're not going to bend over, here it comes again. We're not going to turn around, bend over, grab our ankles, and thank you for ramming our rights up our ass any way you want to. If you really, really want to subject the American people, you're going to cost lives. Tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives. For my own part, I'm quite clear on this. There is no death count of people on the other side that I'm unprepared to accept in order to preserve the United States, in order to preserve the liberties that we claim for ourselves. I, there is not a body count so large that I would go, well, this liberty thing is no longer worth it. You... There are not enough people who have ever existed to be killed in order to dissuade me from the rightness of individual liberty and freedoms. And the ownership of certain types... Now, compare that against the sheep that is... the sheep that are Europe, that are Australia, that are the Canadian people. You stand no chance of prevailing over Americans because our spirits on these things are completely different. Your privileges, your rights emanate from the legislature and they're free to get rid of them any which way they should like uh, to do. And indeed, uh, if, the, if the queen gets tired of your parliament, she can prorogue it or dissolve it on a lark. Um, and you don't have a great capacity to resist. We do. But suppose 
that, uh, that the government just steamrolls us and we all get killed. People on my side, we all die. So what? I would much prefer to die on my feet fighting a good fight than to live in subjection. Or as Thomas Jefferson put it, I like a little dangerous liberty as opposed to a bit of peaceful slavery. ...of guns, or all guns. Japan, too. I'll toss them in because they're a great example. Japan has a little more than one-third of the U.S.'s population crammed into like one one-hundredth of the space. And in 2008, they had 11 firearm-related deaths. 11. But it's a free country. They hold free elections where you won't be killed for voting the wrong way. They have a free market economy. You can first... And there, there's one group of people who guarantee that to the Japanese citizens. Notably, Americans. Do whatever career choices you wish to make. And guns are banned there. In well, for Japanese citizens. Not for my people. Canada, guns are difficult to get. And in 2013, there were 131 firearm-related homicides. 130 you, know, you know what's funny? Is when this wasn't true, when it was easy to get firearms in Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia, the United States, with the same laws, you know, pretty much uh, you know, rather libertarian about it, in a sense, uh, we still had a higher murder rate here than you had in Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and other Commonwealth uh, countries. There's something different about Americans uh, than, than these other countries. You, you say all of nothing by saying, well, you have gun laws and, a lower, and now a lower murder rate. You had that before, you dumb fuck. Again, mathematician, knows how to read data and interpret it, deals, deals with some mathematical type stuff. Uh, dipshit on the internet, who apparently knows none of that. But I've been told about the superiority of the Canadian public, si public school system to that of the American one. Well, I'm a, I suppose I'm not the, the, the most shining example of the American public school system. I only went to public school for a little while. I did private schools. But if you are an exemplar of the Canadian public education system, consider me supremely unimpressed. The border of the United States. We're practically the same country. No, you're not. Now, I jokingly refer to, like, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia as North Seattle, but uh, two completely different lands. That uh, Canadian, uh, Canadians are not like Americans, and Canada is not basically like the United States, though you, you're starting to see our way with uh, some division of powers and whatnot, so I, I encourage that. You do much better to become Republican, but whatever. But I feel pretty... That's not Republican political party, that's as opposed to, you know, monarchy. Free. I can vote. I can say what I want, do what I want, eat, drink, watch, whatever I want. There, your government is treating you well at the moment. Congratulations. Let's hope that goes on for a long, long while. And indeed, let's hope it goes on forever. That isn't the question. Uh, generally, in the United States, our governments treat us reasonably well. The question is, what do you do when the government stops treating you well? In the United States, I know what we do, if need be. We rise up and we shoot those motherfuckers, and then we declare something new, and you know, we do away with the old guard and rearrange our affairs. Fortunately, we don't have to do this very often, but it does come up from time to time. In Canada, there's not a lot that you can do except, oh, please show us some mercy, and then apologize for being Canadian. Bang whoever I want, as long as it's consensual. If I was a woman, I can get an abortion whenever I want. Maybe they have a buy nine, get the tenth one free deal. That all seems pretty free to me. They're gonna give you. They, never mind. I was gonna make a. I was gonna make a bad joke. The only thing I can't do: go down to the store, say one gun, please, slap down money, and walk out with. Great, you're talking about a restriction on liberties Americans have, and this is like a selling point of the system <laughs> that I'll have less freedom than I have now. <laughs> don't work in marketing. Don't 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 do that shiny new death tool and I'm okay with that in the land of the truly free though the United States of America there are over 11,000 homicides by firearm in 2013 11,208 people died because someone intentionally shot them that's not including suicides or accidents hmm Seems to have died on me. Oh god, I hope... I did not intentionally shoot my phone to shut you up, I promise. ...United States. We're practically the same country. ...with 
with your assault rifle to protect your family. It this is awkward. Damn you, technology. This is, however, hypothetical. It's based on nothing but fear that the only reason... One gun, please. Slap down money and walk out with a shiny new death tool. And I'm okay with that. In the land of the... I don't buy shiny ones. Mine are, mine are subdued. But anyway. Truly free, though. The United States of America... Fuck yeah! ...for 11,000 homicides by firearm in 2013. Yes. 11,208 people died because someone intentionally shot them. Ah. Oh. In violation of a law, I note. We really do have laws here against murder. Promise. That's not including suicides or accidentals. Those are premeditated or heat-of-the-moment murders. Everyone says, well, if you ban guns or make them harder to get, criminals will be the only ones who can get them. This is, however, hypothetical. <laughs> it's just hypothetical that it's the criminals who break the law. <laughs> Complete conjecture. <laughs> I don't want to sound overly partisan here, but I, I think there might be something to the argument that it's criminals who break the law. There might be, maybe, possibly, a kernel of truth there. It's based on nothing but fear that the only reason people aren't busting into your homes to kill you right now is because you might be standing in the doorway waiting. No, it's because if someone is interested in obeying the law, and you pass a law, they'll obey it. If they're not, they won't obey it, in which case they become criminals. It's not conjecture or being hypothetical. It's terminological. It's what a criminal is. It's a person who doesn't follow the laws. Your assault rifle to protect your family. It can't be ba Well, I don't know why people don't break into my house other than it's a rare event, so I don't stand a great chance of it uh, in the abstract anyway. But I do know what will happen if it does arise. Uh, one or the other of us is going to be dead. If you, if you ever break into my house... You better be in a, in, you better be eager. You better be in a hurry to surrender or run away, because you'll be dead if you don't, or I'll be dead, or we'll both be dead, or some combination of that, or severely wounded. If you, you might run in, but you won't be walking out. Or if you do, it'll be over my dead body. It's done any real world stats because, as we've shown, Canada and Japan both have super low gun murder rates. But Americans are like a child at a buffet. They're unwilling to try anything new. They just. Right, we're the country that threw off a monarchy and became a stable republic, but we're unwilling to try anything new, and the new thing we should try is exactly what everybody else is doing. That's how, that'll be avant-garde. <laughs> guys, guys, I've got, a, I've got an idea for something new. What? Let's do what everybody else is already doing. Oh, you apparently don't understand America. We're not followers, sir. We're a bit of the leading country. We're the one that, that other people... Uh, have to look up to, not down on, like we do to the rest of the world. I know it pisses off people from other countries that we look down at you. It's partly a joke, but partly not. Uh, yeah, look, being number one on things, you, you, you get sharp, you get, uh, sharp shooting done at you all the time. Take the rough with the smooth. But the same thing they got last time. It's not a slippery slope. You won't give up guns or... Sure it is. Uh, we've got a century of history of, of this. Uh, every time a gun law is passed, it fails to do what people like you promise it will do. And then, so immediately, the suggestion is another law, which will fail. And then, you know, that's been going on for about a century now. And then you point to places like Japan, and, you know, complete ban in Japan, except for, you know, the Americans. We, we, have, a, we have some pull with the government there, and have for a while now. But anyway... <laughs> um... <laughs> That's a complete ban on, on Japanese uh, citizens. So it's completely appropriate for people like me to think maybe possibly the end state of this system is precisely that, because it's what you point at. ...them regulated, and then the next thing you know, jackbooted stormtroopers are going to tear through your house and toss you and your family in a bunker 20 stories underneath Montana. It's funny because they always mention... Look what happened in Germany in the 30s and 40s, as well as in the Soviet Union and in Cambodia when they banned citizens from having guns. It's funny you mentioned the Soviet Union. Russia just uh, recently, I'm told, has uh, passed a law allowing people to buy firearms for their personal defense because apparently banning firearms and all the restrictive firearms laws did not stop their murder problem, which shocked me. I was surprised. I'm like, I've been told that if you write uh, <laughs> gun laws, it stops murder. Apparently the murder laws won't stop it, but the gun laws will. You know what happened? 
genocide happened. But then when you mention how gun control works in other countries, they're very quick to point out... You, you, this, this is the thing, though. You've not demonstrated that gun control works. You've demonstrated that there are differences in the numbers. But these differences in the numbers, in, in roughly the same proportion, more or less, uh, is historically there. Even when, like, England had uh, pretty much unrestrained access to firearms, they still had a much lower murder rate than the United States did. Oh, and by the way, they kept better records. So our murder rate was even higher than we knew. We're talking about just the ones that we bothered to record. This, is, this has always been true. You've not shown that there's any causal link. Indeed, in the United States, uh, our country, uh, I'm sorry, our states, our countries, <laughs> uh, like Vermont, you, know, you, want, you want a fully automatic weapon? Knock yourself out. You want a silencer for it, too? Take an extra. You want to carry it concealed? Whatever. Open? Fine. Near a school? Go for it. Lowest murder rate in the country. Rivals any country in Europe, pretty much. Yeah, but we're not the same as them. So... You're not like other countries, but you're worried you are like Nazi Germany or Pol Pot's... We're not like other countries precisely because we understand human nature and we've taken steps against it. The founders of this country uh, thought about it very carefully. Uh, they did a survey of all the governments in the world and the history of government, and they realized that there are certain things that tend to recur, and that is power corrupts people, that no one is so good as to be trusted with power. Uh, and therefore, you have the system that we devised. And it's because of that system that we're able to at least have a chance of stopping these things when and if they arise. Or when and if someone tries to become a tyrant, like in the Battle of Athens, or recently in my own neck of the woods where you know, people went out and said, Hey, uh, city council, let's have, a, let's have a conversation. No, no, don't get up and run this time. We need for you to sit down and listen. Sir? Sit down and listen. Odia? You, you stop large tyrannies in the long term by, by addressing them when they start small, which all tyrants start small. You don't wake up overnight, magic yourself into the fucking dictator of a country. It takes time to get that kind of situation. And uh, you, you, you have to gain influence when it first starts, when it first gets started. They think the worst will happen, but the worst is already here, in the form of every asshole in the country having such easy access to guns that that's how they decide to solve their perceived problems. Their perceived problems, like the perception that when the government won't stand for election, or when it shoots people who are voting, you know, goes out in the street and shoots people who are voting, a black guy in this case, when it steals the ballots to count them in secret, that it's just a perception that that's the problem. That's the way democracy works, sir. Just trust, just take it from your overlords. That's how it works, eh? And arming everyone in a school or a movie theater or wherever would just lead to more hair-trigger incidents. <laughs> in my state, the teachers are armed <laughs> in some places. Uh, certainly, uh, well, not in the, not in the uh, K-12, through but in the colleges. They, well, teachers don't, but students can carry. We're not having this rash of shootings in Washington State now, are we? No. Uh, and that's because people who carry firearms understand there are consequences for their bad use to include the fact that other people around you might put you down. <laughs> and by put you down, I don't mean they'll say rude things about you or your family. I mean, you know, when you start murdering these people over here, there's always a, someone like me behind you who's going to put a bullet through your head to stop you from committing the murder. Angry assholes solving arguments with bullets. Shh. Stop talking during the movie! Fuck you, I paid for my ticket! I... You know, I carry when I go to the theater, and it never occurred to me to murder people so I could enjoy the rest of the movie. I don't know why that never occurred to me. I'm sure that if I, like, murdered, you know, a couple of teenagers who were talking over the movie, that everybody else would turn around, they'd clap, and then we'd all go back to watching the movie, and then after the movie is over, uh, I would turn myself into the cops who were waiting out in the, in the foyer for me to get there and turn myself in after having murdered a couple of people for making noise in the theater. Why, why have I not thought about murdering people because they're being inconvenient as opposed to only using my firearm for the defense of my life or the life of other people? God, I can't fucking imagine why I never drew the connection where being irritated is just like being in mortal danger. And since I can shoot people if I'm in mortal danger to save myself or to save my family or someone else, it therefore follows of necessity that I get to shoot people for being irritating. You are a fucking moron. Do what I want. 
We know humans love the- If that's three shots fired, all I can say is there better have been three annoying teenagers. Because if you're shooting anything less, then someone's not a good shot. Easiest solution available. That's why we eat fast food instead of cook. Right. Committing murder is the easiest solution. <laughs> then apparently Americans don't like to take the easy way out given how many guns we have in relation to how few murders we perpetrate. Apparently we like doing things the hard way. We just <laughs> give it a good old college try. We'll try everything else, all the hard stuff first, and if that doesn't work, then we'll take the easy way out of just murdering each other. Fuck off, you retard. Drive instead of walk or bike. Watch the movie when it comes out instead of read the book. Well, these people would... You know, I'm told there are people who can read and watch movies. I'm not one of them. I, I, I can't read and watch a movie uh, both. Uh, generally, well, I can occasionally, but usually it's one or the other because for some reason, uh, a, a book that is really well written will get in the hands of a movie maker who goes, my God, that shit's brilliant. Let's change everything about it. <laughs> oh, and that really annoys me. You know what? Since those Hollywood folks annoy me by changing endings like Cujo, uh, you know, this is where it all started, is Cujo, the, when the boy dies, when the boy lives, but since that's annoying, I guess, mutatis mutandis, I get to go murder Hollywood folks, right? Because that's what being irritated means, is I'm now justified in murdering people, you dumb fucking son of a bitch. Publicly educated, I'm going to guess. It's just a conjecture. Just use something else, knives or bats or whatever. I say, let them try. You let me know when 10 to 20 people are killed in a mass stabbing or blood. I can think of one mass stabbing that had more, slightly more than 10 or 12 victims. It had about a million. And uh, my country, much to its uh, disgrace, sat by, like your country did, like all the other countries did, and did absolutely nothing. An entire genocide was carried out with fucking cutlery, you dumb son of a bitch. I guess Boudicca's... Boudicca the Icenes didn't get, get, get cut down because they only had cutlery at the time. In fact, in a school in Pennsylvania in 2014, 21 people were injured in a mass stabbing. No deaths. Not one. In the Battle of Athens. Mass shooting. No deaths. Not one. And they liberated a town without a one to, apparently. Shut up, you dumb fuck. But you know what? Tell me. No matter what side of the argument you land on, you have to agree that something has to be done. Oh yes, the ever sought after something. The unicorn of the gun control movement. It doesn't matter if you don't believe that it has anything to do with guns, even though, regardless of motive, that's almost always the weapon of choice in the U.S. Regardless of motive? Weapon of choice? It is a weapon of choice. Guns are really good, at bringing about other people's deaths. The, you know, that works in, in two, two directions. Um, the, the same tool that will let a murderer commit a murder can also be used by would-be murder victims to stop murderers. So it, it, it's, it's a tool and it equalizes power. The handicapped uh, grandmother you know, in a wheelchair who, whose house gets broken into is just as able to shoot the burglar as the other way around. You realize something has to be done. So let them try something, even if it means getting a gun is, at the very least, as difficult as being allowed to drive a car. If it doesn't work, you get to say, I told you so. What? Well, we have that system, you know, private cells, you know, the ones you were whining about. We have a you know, very comparable system, so you should be happy with that, except that you're not, because you're a dishonest, dissembling dipshit. Have a great day, everybody else. Eh?